Hi, welcome to ME313, Mechanical Engineering Thermodynamics. The topic of this video is the vapor compression cycle, and the sections in the textbook are 11.1 through 11.4. So here are the learning outcomes. At the end of this, you'll know the basic components of a vapor compression refrigeration cycle. You'll be able to draw a TS diagram for an ideal VCR cycle and state the assumptions that go into that. You'll also be able to solve for the coefficient of performance for that VCR cycle, and you will understand the effects of both compressor efficiency and condenser pressure drop on the coefficient of performance. So first, let's go ahead and, and <clears throat> remind ourselves of what is the coefficient of performance for a refrigerator. So here I have a picture of a refrigerator, and as we all know, um, refrigerators have a power cord, which has a work input requirement, or power input. And what happens with the refrigerator is we have this cold space, but it's sitting in a warm room. And so heat tends to go into this refrigerated space. And the other component is that on the back of this, there's a series of coils. And if you've ever put your hand on the back of the refrigerator, you realize they're warm and there's heat that is coming off. And that would be a heat output. Um, we often, instead of calling this Q in and Q out, we think of the fact that since this is at a lower temperature, we call this QL for QLow, and then these are, since these are warmer, we will call this QH. And I tend to use those a little bit interchangeably, but <clears throat> it's nice to remind ourselves that this is always occurring at a low, the input is always occurring at this lower temperature, and the output is occurring at a higher temperature. Now, the coefficient of performance, this is essentially um, an efficiency, and so we call it COP and then sub R because there's also the coefficient of performance of heat pumps, if you remember. And this is really just defined as, well, what is our desired product um, over our required input? And, well, the desirable part of a refrigerator is the fact that it is refrigerator that keeps the area um, cold, so it would be QL, and the requirement is going to be the work input WN. So there's our coefficient of performance. We can also apply an energy balance over the entire thing and have N equals out and work input plus the QL is going to be equal to the QH. So there's our first law energy balance for it. And the, the thing that's different about coefficient of performance versus efficiency is the fact that there's nothing that says that, that QL has to be less than the work input. So therefore, the coefficient of performance has a lower limit of zero, which means that it isn't able to, to keep anything cold, but there's not really any upper limit on it. So it's not like efficiency where the upper limit was one. <clears throat> These can easily be two, three, or four, and so you'll often see numbers that are greater than one. And that's one of the primary reasons they use this COP instead of the symbol eta in terms of the efficiency. All right, so let's look at the, the uh, vapor compression refrigeration cycle. Um, and there's four main components for it. And so there is a compressor, um, and then there's two heat exchangers, a heat exchanger at a high temperature and a heat exchanger at a low temperature, and there is a throttling valve. Um, but there, any type of um, fluid that is going through phase change can operate in here. These tend to be refrigerants um, because their phase change occurs at, at lower temperatures, so we're able to keep um, things colder uh, than we would if we were to, for example, try to use water. Um, this is the QL at the lower temperature, and this is QH, which is coming out at the higher temperature, and then we have a work input that is occurring there. Um, this is a throttling valve. There's no work requirements and no heat input or output. They tend to be iso, um, isenthalpic. In fact, we'll remind ourselves what that means in just a moment. And so there's no um, Q or W associated with the throttling valve. Let's go ahead and, and draw this cycle on the TS diagram. And so we'll go ahead and start over here at point one. Now this right over here, this is the freezer box at the bottom. And so what happens is a mixture comes in here and it absorbs energy. So it's going to become more of a vapor. And what tends to come out is something that's either a saturated vapor or a superheated vapor. And in the ideal cycle, we can assume that point one is a saturated vapor. So it's right there on the right hand side of the TS diagram. It then runs through a compressor, and for the ideal cycle, that would be an isentropic compressor. So it's going to go straight up on the TS diagram. So point two will be directly above point one in the superheated region. Then this runs through a heat exchanger. These are the coils on the back of the refrigerator. They lose heat, um, lose energy, sorry. Not lose heat, I guess would be fine to say as well. Um, and so the process tends to go down 
into the saturation region. It's occurring at more or less a constant pressure, and one of the assumptions is that there is no pressure drop in the ideal cycle. Um, and then, so there's going to be some point three over here. So we're going to assume that that also occurs on the phase diagram, but now it's going to occur over here at the saturated liquid side on the left-hand side, and so that would be point three. Um, then going from three to four, we go through the throttling valve, and this throttling valve is isenthalpic, which means that H is a constant. The enthalpy doesn't change, and so it tends to drop down and to the right somewhat. The entropy increases because we're taking the liquid and turning it into a mixture, and vapors have a higher entropy than uh, liquid, um, but we're dropping the temperature, so there's kind of two competing effects, but in the end, the entropy does increase somewhat, and so point four is down there somewhere in, in the uh, mixture region, and then four across one assumes that there's no pressure drop in the freezer box. So here's our, our TS diagram. Um, one of the things I want to point out is pretty important when we start looking at the performance um, of these is what we really care about is QL. So we want to know how much heat we can go ahead and, and remove from the refrigerated space. And so this is between points 4 and point 1. And if you remember, delta S is equal to Q over T if something occurs at a constant temperature. This is occurring at a constant temperature. So therefore, Q is equal to T delta S which means that this area right here is the cooling capacity underneath there. This right there is QL. And so when we kind of want to visually think of the effects of optimizing the cycle, what we would like to do often is to go ahead and increase this area without increasing the work requirement of the cycle. All right, so let's go ahead and, and solve a, a vapor compression refrigeration cycle, and we'll go ahead and make all the ideal assumptions here. And so we're going to operate between two pressure limits, a low pressure of 150 kPa and a high pressure of 800 kPa. And we don't actually need to specify anything else other than this is an ideal cycle. So we're going to take all those assumptions that I just mentioned um, and apply those as well. So we'll go ahead and solve this in EES. All right, so here I have the problem set up in EES. Um, at the top, I have my specified conditions of the pressure high pressure and low pressure, which are points 1 and point 2. And then I'm making the assumptions of the ideal cycle, which says that I've got a saturated vapor um, at point 1 and a saturated liquid at point 3. <clears throat> then I'm going to have some isobaric steps, constant pressure, again, for the ideal cycle. I'm assuming there's no pressure drop between 1 and 4. That is in the freezer box and between point 2 and 3, um, which is the condenser, which is the heating, the, the warm coils on the back. All right. Um, then the next step down is I'm assuming that it's an isentropic compressor, so I use the uh, two intensive variables of pressure and quality to go ahead and find my initial entropy S1, and S2 is going to be equal to S1. And the other thing I'm going to use is my throttling valve, which is a constant enthalpy, and so that point 3, I know both the pressure and the quality, and then I can go ahead and tie the two enthalpies together. So let's go ahead and, and solve that. Let me go ahead and comment out the bottom part, and we'll come back to that part in just a moment. So if we go ahead and solve this now, we look at our table. We've got a pressure at every point, and then we have the entropy at two points and the enthalpy at two points, so the problem is completely specified. So we can go ahead and now go ahead and finish solving this problem. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uncomment these last little parts here. Let's go ahead and look at that. Um, so what this does now, I'm going to go ahead and find those last two enthalpy values using values of P, and I'm using X here, X1. I could have also used S1 because I've already found that value. Um, and then now that I have an enthalpy at every point, the heat out, okay, that's the heat at the high temperature is H1 minus H4. The work input is going to be the enthalpy between H2 and H1. And so my coefficient of performance is going to be uh, Q out. Oops, that is completely wrong. That should be called Q in. I'm sorry about that. Um, the equation is written correctly, but let's go ahead and call that Q in. That's not a heat output. That is a heat input. Um, there we go, Q in. It's not going to change anything for the coefficient of performance. But now we've at least recognized that this is a heat input um, over the work input. And so now we see our coefficient of performance is 4.161. All right. Um, let's see. Let me return to our 
slides here. Um, and now I want to talk about the non-ideal vapor compression cycle. <clears throat> and so the non-ideal vapor compression cycle would be things such as, for example, let's talk about an inefficient compressor between one and two. So I'll label my points. There's point one and point two. And if this is inefficient, um, the entropy would increase. And so, for example, my point, I'll call it two prime, it might be up there on the same isobar of that pressure. What I recognize now is I'm going to have a larger increase in enthalpy and I would have a larger work requirement. Um, now, there's a couple of things with these compressors that you should recognize with a refrigerator is um, there may be some cooling that goes on. And so if you were to go ahead and have so that it's not adiabatic and you were to lose some heat across here, that would actually reduce your work requirement and you could actually start bringing it toward closer to 0.2. And in fact, if you did enough cooling, even though it was inefficient, there's no reason that you wouldn't be able to put a point there. I'll call it two double prime. So this would actually reduce your work requirement from an isentropic one. Um, this is saying I have an inefficient pump, but I'm removing so much heat. I'm actually functioning better than the adiabatic isothermal or the um, adiabatic isentropic pump. <clears throat> um, let's look at a couple other effects that we could have. Um, we could look at, at pressure drops, for example. So if we had a pressure drop between two and three. So here's point two on an isobar. Um, I might go ahead and have a point, I'll call it three prime. And if there was a large pressure drop through these coils, the point would, uh, the diagram would actually come down, down, down to that point right there. Um, and we could also talk about pressure drops through the freezer box point four. And so um, I could have a point four prime here that goes across down one. So that's kind of what the, the non-ideal cycle would look like. So let's quantitatively look at what some of the effects of this are. And so I'm going to go ahead and look at my points from, um, first of all, we'll go ahead and look at the inefficient compressor. And we'll go ahead and look at that um, in EES. Okay, <clears throat> here we are back in EES. And I've made one change to the problem that we had before. Um, and that is I've added an 80% efficient compressor. So if we look under here, um, under the compressor line, it's actually no longer isentropic, so I should remove uh, that statement there, it's just a, a compressor. And instead of saying S2 is S1, I now am finding my um, isentropic enthalpy and then specifying that at 80% to find my actual enthalpy at H2. Everything else is saying the same, so I'm just looking at the effect of the um, compressor efficiency. And if we go ahead and solve this and now look at what our coefficient of performance, if you remember last time it was about 4.1, just a little bit over 4.1. We've now dropped our, our uh, coefficient of performance down to 3.3. So pretty marked change in terms of the efficiency of my compressor. Now the other effect of the non-ideal cycle I want to look at would be the effect of pressure drop, for example. So let's go ahead and look at what the effect of a pressure drop would be um, on the coils in the back. And so that right over there is going to be, it's called the condenser, because what's occurring there is condensing. And I'm going to go ahead and, and to, to not cloud things too much, I'm going to go ahead and, and go back to the um, isentropic compressor. And in fact, I can do that by just changing that efficiency equal to 1. And so just to verify, yeah, there's our, our coefficient of performance of 4.16, which is what we want to compare against. And so let's go ahead and find out what the effect of a pressure drop would be. So that would be, for example, saying that P3 is going to be something less than P2. So um, we're going between 800 and 150. So let's go ahead and say we have, for example, a 50 kPa pressure drop in there, so it says that P3 is going to be 50 less than P2. And if we go ahead and look at this, um, we see now our coefficient of performance is 4.2. It's actually increased. Um, last time it was about 4.1, so which might seem a little counterintuitive. We have a pressure drop, which you would think of as an inefficiency, and we're actually getting something with a higher coefficient of performance. So, so let's go ahead and just start to take some extreme examples. And let's go ahead and, for example, um, let's go ahead and say there was, like, say, a 400 and, and oops, um, a 450 kPa pressure drop in there. So that would be just a gigantic pressure drop and find out what the effect on the coefficient of performance is. Um, and now if we look at that, well, we're all the way up at 5.2. And in fact, it looks like the larger the pressure drop is that we have uh, in the condenser, the better it is for the coefficient of performance. And, and as I said, that might seem a little un unintuitive, but let's go ahead and, and look at what's going on in our diagram, and it might help explain what's going on here. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and look at here. So here's my, my uh, 
my coils on the back, and what I'm saying is that I've got these really thin coils and I've got a really, really large pressure drop. And so what I'm doing is I keep moving further and further down here. And so let's go ahead and, and give ourselves a clean diagram here. And let's look at this. This is point two there. This is point three um, at the ideal cycle. And I was saying I have a really, really large pressure drop. So maybe I was all the way down at an isobar that was right down there. And so let's go ahead and say that we, this was our point right over there. So this is point three prime. This is that really large pressure drop. Okay. Well, we were still specifying the fact that this was a saturated liquid at this point. And so now if we were to complete this diagram, this would drop down to my specified low pressure and go over there. And now let's go ahead and compare. Remember, this is the heating, this is the cooling capacity down here. This is QL. Look what I've effectively done. I've just increased it by this little area right over here. So now you can kind of visually see why when we're specifying this large pressure drop, we're actually increasing the coefficient of performance. But that's really not a good representation of what happens. And the reason is, if you keep in mind, that this, um, what's, this temperature up here is much higher than the temperature of the room. And in fact, this right here might be the temperature of the room. <clears throat> and that way we could go ahead and be losing heat because this, this whole thing has to be at a higher temperature than the temperature of the room. Well, you realize as this temperature difference is large, you can go ahead and, and lose a lot of heat through that heat exchanger. But as it gets closer and closer to this point, you're, you're, um, it's going to be more difficult to lose heat. And in fact, it would be impossible to lose heat at that point. So even though you have a large pressure drop in here, you would never actually be able to get to this point. And so you would end up coming down and you would just be maybe ending up at that point there by the time you were exiting your coils, dropping down over here. And this would actually be a better representation of the cooling capacity, which we can clearly see would be a reduced coefficient of performance. <clears throat> now, in order to specify that point, we need to know something about the fluid dynamics and heat transfer that's occurring, which is a little beyond the scope of this class. So we're just going to qualitatively understand the effects of it and why just changing that pressure um, over at point three without changing anything else wasn't really a good measure of, of the change on the efficiency. <clears throat>